Hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture in our nonlinear analysis in the finite element method series. In today's, in today's lecture we are going to check out a simple example, an analytical example in which we are going to try to understand how an analysis by hand is done in nonlinear fashion and to understand the basic principles of that. Those are some first examples. Today I will cover one example, which is the example of a simple bar. And you will notice throughout this example that even the simplest of bars is going to be some headache to analyze nonlinearly. Of course, luckily for us, there are finite element softwares that do that. However, in order to appreciate what they are doing, we need to try to understand how this is done by hand, manually. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, so if you are new to this channel and new to this video, please notice that this is part of a video series, which I'll be linking on the top right, called Nonlinear Analysis in the Finite Element Method. All right, so that's the simplest of examples you can have. I have a simple bar, an axial element, which is uh, loaded by something called R, and there are two pieces. The section B, it's called, which is the right side piece, and the section A, which is the left side piece. Of course, obviously, if you apply a load on this point, then section B is going to shrink, i.e. Uh, get shorter, and section A is going to extend, which means it's going to get longer. Also, section B is, is going to be under compression, and section A is going to be under tension. Fantastic. Now, to top it all off, our um, response or the material relationship is going to be a linear one. It's going to be a bilinear one, which is basically the elastic part up to a certain yielding point, and then the pelastic part all the way until the absolute maximum strain. Now, this could be a failure point or basically the maximum allowed strain in the, in the material. So, okay, now, of course, this is once again a simplification. You will see that even this example uses a simplification because a stress-strain curve doesn't look like this. This stress-strain curve looks kind of like this with all the bumps and up and downs and so on. This is actually a simplification. The reason why we are doing this simplification is because it's already complicated, so simplification I can do is amazing and it helps me in solving this problem. There are some important points. Uh, since we are do dealing with a higher level course, we need to now start thinking like master level students. So every word has a meaning. If you look on the description, he is saying or assuming that displacements and strains are small and that the load is applied slowly. Now those are two assumptions which have two implications. Uh, the strains being small and the displacements being small means that our nonlinearity is material nonlinearity only. Professor Barter in his book is taking a limit of 0.04 strain for this, which is kind of something I understand. 0.04 uh, means 4%, so uh, I think that's a good strain. We'll adopt his limit. Small strain, we have small displacements, and we have only material nonlinearity. We are not going to assume geometric nonlinearity. The slow load application, uh, this is something I'm kind of disagreeing with. You can see that the time of application is quite rapid. The entire problem takes six seconds to finish, which is relatively uh, fast, to be honest. Now, of course, here the, the idea is, okay, what is slow and what is fast? Um, it's a long story, but I want to give a small idea here. The small idea I want to give is that it depends on the natural frequency. If you have an element that has a very high natural frequency, which means the period of vibration is very slow, say, the period of vibration is 0 0.001. So basically its uh, frequency is one kilohertz because the frequency and the period of vibrations are inverses of each other. So if it has a period of vibration of 0 0.001, then the two second bump here seems to be huge in comparison to the natural frequency. Now I know some of you are higher level students and would think, oh, wait a minute, the natural frequency there is mode one and mode two and mode three. And dear hypothetical viewer, yes, you are right. Uh, it's not only one natural frequency, you have multiple ones. However, I'm just going to keep it for the node num mode 1, because this is the most mode that gets excited. And, of course, there is a lot to be talked in structural dynamics, but I don't want to go through it. However, I just want to say that the term slow and fast should be related to the natural frequency of the structure. Uh, if the natural frequency of the structure is like 3 seconds, then a two-second pulse would actually almost excite the first mode and would cause some dynamic issues. So anyway, he, of course, doesn't explain that because in Professor Bata's book, it's not his uh, priority. I just wanted to mention that because now, I mean, we should question everything we have, right? 
Okay, so that is the problem. What does he want from us? He wants from us for this force application function, he wants you to draw the displacement function. Because you are going to provide a force, the force seems to change with time, which means I have a different displacement. Starting with the analysis, a simple structural analysis reveals that, well, reaction A minus, I mean, if you sum up forces in X equals zero, this is statics. RA is negative because it goes to the left, RT is positive because it goes to the right, and RB is positive because it goes to the right. So this is the relationship you will end up with. Of course, rewriting it will give you this. Okay, so far so good. This is just statics, summation of forces in X. Now, you know that the force inside A is going to be related to the stresses inside A, and the force inside B is going to be related to the stresses inside B. So I can replace the force of B with the stress multiplied by the area, because you know that sigma equals force over area. So if you want to replace a force with the sigma, then you have to multiply it by the area. This is exactly what happens here. Sigma A is a stress inside element A. If you multiply it by the area, then you get the force in A. Sigma B is the stress inside element B. If you multiply it by the area, then you immediately get the force inside B. Now, if you, of course, you, are, you have a valid question. This is the reaction. Why is it equal to the force inside B? Because, I mean, if you cut and take a... So if you just take a section and calculate the internal force, you will realize that the internal force is equal to the reaction, which kind of makes sense. Now you can see that there are a lot of T's, T, 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 T everywhere. And don't worry about this. Uh, this T R basically means R as a function of T, uh, because you saw that the force is changing with time. So R pre, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's very technical language. The problem with this book is if you try to read it alone, you will like drown in the technicalities. So of course I have to like dissect it for you. This pre-superscript T means basically the force at the time step T. Now of course you're, you're, you're valid in asking why doesn't he write RT like this? First of all, this looks cooler. And second of all, later you will notice that this subscript is going to be reserved for other things like the element A, and the element B and so on. So a, a pre-superscript kind of makes sense and that's what he's using. So this cool TR just means force at time T. Seems goes for everything. Anything with a pre-superscript of T means at time T. This, ex this equation is unsolvable because I have two unknowns, sigma B and sigma A. I need the compatibility equation. This is something you have studied in university and might be the nightmare that you were faced with, the compatibility equation. I want to simplify the word. Compatibility is basically that the deflection and the displacement should make sense. For example, imagine that section B shortens by two millimeters. Well, this means also that section A should extend by two millimeters. I mean, if B shortens two millimeters, A should extend two millimeters. Because if A doesn't extend following B, then you would have a disconnection, which basically is another word of saying that displacement just doesn't make sense. Now to the stresses. We have the stress equation. We have just uh, spoken about this. But now the big question is, wait a minute. The stress, sigma B and sigma A, how do I calculate those? And why would I need to calculate those? I would need to calculate those because compatibility has to do with strains and displacements. So we somehow have to figure this out. And to figure displacements out, we need to use to find the sigmas because you know that strain and sigma are somehow related. But there is a problem in that because the relationship between the strain and the stress is previously linear, but now nonlinear. So the question is, wait a minute. Are we in strains before the yielding strain or are we in strains after the yielding strain? Because if you are before, you have one equation, and if you are after, you have another equation. To show you that, look at the two equations here on the left side. If you look at the equations on the left side, well, first of all, you know Hooke's law. Sigma equals the elastic modulus multiplied by the strain. And of course, you can rewrite this by saying strain equals sigma over the elastic modulus. This is for the linear or elastic region. So this equation is valid for this region only. Anything outside the region cannot be covered by this equation and we need another equation. The other equation looks like this. How does it do that? Well, say you have a certain sigma, let's say we have this sigma, and uh, based on this sigma, you have a line here. The slope of the line is ET, 
And uh, if you have a sigma, then let's say you have this sigma here, then you know that the slope equals delta y over delta x. Uh, what is uh, delta y? Delta y is your sigma minus sigma yield. So you can see that this is your delta y. And if you are interested in delta x, you have to basically rewrite this. Delta x, which is strain difference here, equals delta y over the slope. And you can see here delta y and the slope is not the simple elastic modulus, but is the tangential elastic modulus. Oh, let me just say it is the weaker elastic modulus because after yielding, you have a certain drop in the slope, which is basically this one. It's a slope after the yielding. But wait, that's your delta x. Basically, it is this delta, the difference between the yielding point and the strain point you are at. If you want to have the total strain, then you just add to it the yielding strain. This is how the equation got derived. You might need to pause the video right now and try to derive it yourself. It would take 10 minutes from you, but it is really worth the effort. So I really suggest you do that. For the unloading, this is something you studied in mechanics and materials. If you are at any point, elastic or pelastic if you unload it follows a path parallel to the elastic line which is basically that the change in strain is going to be the strain change in stiffness divided by the elastic modulus and the elastic modulus here is always going to be the linear elastic modulus regardless of where you are if you are in the elastic region it will follow the elastic modulus if you are in the pelastic region it will follow still parallel to the elastic region, so that's why you have an E always. Now, there is one thing I wanted to pay attention here. The stress-strain relationship, as Professor Barta says, is a valid in tension and in compression. I have my little reservation on this. Here, there is a buckling which was ignored, and if buckling is included, Oh boy, it's going to be a nightmare. So be happy that you don't include buckling. The compatibility equation means that delta A plus delta B equals zero, meaning if B shrinks, so delta is negative two, then uh, A should extend by two. Fantastic. So let's get back to this. Now, here we established the stress-strain relationships, but of course the question is, where are we? In the load curve, we have different load values. So let's start with the smaller load values. If you have smaller load values, then the load is not enough to make any section yield, meaning that both section A and section B, so the left side and the right side, both of them behave elastically. If that's the case, then it's easy, because now you can simply say that epsilon equals sigma over A. So the force is going to be sigma B. I mean, this is the statics equation. This is just a reminder. And now we start using the elastic equation to replace the stresses. Like stress at B is strain at B multiplied by the elastic modulus because we are in the linear domain, we are in this domain. And sigma A equals the strain A multiplied by the elastic modulus again because we are in the linear domain. Also notice that the strain is delta over L. And uh, rewriting this, I mean plugging in the value of sigma, you get delta over L multiplied by EA, and if you, in case you remember your statics, your mechanics course, delta in the axial loaded elements was PL over AE, meaning that your, your P here, the force, is basically delta over L multiplied by AE, and that's what you see here. Remember, this is all only valid for the elastic modulus. Now, are we stuck here? Well, the answer is no. Now, the teaching assistant, I don't know why, told me that I should include this magic card or something. It's some sort of reference. I don't get it. He also told me to say... So he's saying basically like, are we stuck? No, we are not stuck. You would think we are stuck because you would think, I don't know what delta B is, and I don't know what delta A is. But in fact, you do know. Because by the compatibility equation, you know that delta A plus delta B should equal zero or this relationship. Which means you can replace delta B with the negative of delta A, as you can see here. Following on with this, you can take this, throw on the other side, and then take some common factors. Now this is done, and you can see the final equation here. The laughable thing in K.G. Batter's book is that to reach this equation, he just writes two sentences. Like... This entire derivation is basically ignored, most likely. 
So in the end, this is the equation that connects the force with the displacement. There is a small trick that was played here. Delta A was replaced with U. Well, okay, fine, we can accept that. Meaning that you can rewrite the equation by saying U equals the load divided by a number, and this number is taken by E multiplied by A multiplied by this stuff. Fantastic. Also notice that sigma A in this case is R over 3A, and sigma B in that case is negative 2 over 3A. Fantastic. Now, this is the relationship between the displacement and the force in the linear domain. Now, what happens if I increase the force a little bit? Well, if I increase the force a little bit, then I have a problem. I have a problem because now, for some reason, at a certain load, the section B starts yielding. Like somewhere in the middle, A is elastic and B is pilastic. Now, how do you know that? Well, based on the previous revelation, you can see that sigma A is smaller than sigma B, and since sigma B is larger, it means that it will be yielding first. So sigma B in this domain is yielding, however, sigma A is not yet yielding. Now, when does this happen? Well, you remember that sigma B equals so-and-so, so just set sigma Y here, because the question is, what is the force that makes B yield? So set the sigma to be sigma E, then you can find R. R, I mean, if you just use my brain calculator, R is going to be 3 over 2 in the negative, I think, multiplied by A, multiplied by sigma E. I hope I didn't mess up something up. Yeah, there it is. So that's the load for you. Uh, what happens then? Well, semi-pandemonium. The real pandemonium happens when both are yielding, A and B. But that's something that is not going to happen in this example, and I will tell you later why. For section A, because there is no yielding, nothing changes. The stress-strain or stress-displacement relationship is still the same. However, for section B, everything changes. Because suddenly for section B, we need to find the stress at B as a function of the strain and displacement. Now, sigma B in this case is going to be the sigma yield plus the sigma plastic. Look, let's say here on the left on the right side this stress strain diagram let's say the stress of b is here now now the stress of b here is equal to the sigma yield plus this extra sigma in the plastic region now because it's compressive the sigma yield is negative and the sigma plastic is negative fantastic so what is this sigma plastic this sigma plastic is the amount of sigma above the yielding point now let's just give a small idea example so let's clarify a little bit. Say we are at a strain of 0 0.003. For some reason, we are here. The sigma here, how do I calculate that? Well, the sigma here is the sigma yield plus the small delta sigma here. I will call it sigma plastic. Now, if you take the triangle here, that's a triangle and it has a slope of ET. So the slope ET equals the delta sigma, which is what I want, sigma plastic, this is delta y divided by delta x, which is 0 0.001, meaning my epsilon minus the epsilon yield. Of course, there are some sign shenanigans, but I mean, the principle is still the same. Meaning that the plastic sigma is going to equal to the difference in epsilon multiplied by the elastic modulus, but not really the elastic modulus, but the tangential elastic modulus, or let me say, the elastic modulus, the weaker elastic modulus. Now, this equation is what you see here for sigma PL. You are rewriting a little bit further because the strain is U over L. You can see us rewriting this. So, this means that basically sigma B equals this entire blob of material or stuff and sigma yield. Once again, KG Bata's book basically slaughters the entire thing and tells you, hey, here is the equation and deal with it. Anyway, going on, just following the simple steps, because I did, I did the derivation here for you, right? So I can tell you that you should follow the simple steps of substitution. Uh, truth to be said, they're not simple. They would take 20 minutes of time. But you can pause the video and try to derive this cute equation yourself. And uh, based on that, you can calculate ut as a function of rt, giving you this cool equation. Meaning that you have now two equations for you. One equation is in the elastic domain, and one equation is in the semi-elastic domain, meaning A is elastic and B is plastic. 
Dr. Professor Barter drops a bombshell and tells you, hey, by the way, Section A will never plasticize. Well, why? Because according to the equations, plasticization of A happens when R is 4.02 times 10 power something. Now, he's arguing that this never happens because R reaches 4. So based on his argument, he tells you that A is never plastic. Now, wait a minute. How does he know that? How does he get the value? Well, he has the elastic modulus. I mean, look at those values. He has the strain of yield, which means he can calculate the yield stress, which means he can calculate the internal force, and from it, he can calculate R using statics. So, long story short, trust him. I tried to do this myself, and I found out that it is indeed correct. Finally, in the unloading path, if you unload, then basically you get this equation. How does he get this equation? Well, let me show you. First of all, I have already derived for you this equation, which looks like this. Let me show you. I have already derived you this equation, so it's repeated here, as you can see. And which means that if you put a delta for the R, then you get a delta for the U. And what you have to do is say delta U equals delta R over everything else, which is what happens here. Notice we are using the elastic modulus in the elastic domain because unloading happens elastically regardless of where you are. B is here, it unloads elastically. A is here, it unloads elastically. When does the unloading happen? The unloading happens here after you pass four. With that being said, we have three relationships that govern the U movement of the element. The first relationship is this. This is the elastic domain. The second relationship is this. That is the semi-plasticization when B plasticizes. And this here is the unloading stage. You can see that in the beginning there is a stiff structure because both sections are linear. Suddenly there is a break because B is nonlinear and A is linear. And if you had continued past this point, then you would reach a point and then break again because suddenly both plasticize. But we never reached this position, we actually unloaded, and that's what happened. Now, how does this help us in the finite element method? A lot and a little, actually. A little, because the formulation of finite element uh, equations for the solution of nonlinear problems is kind of different from this example. A lot, because you can see a key detail, detail in the entire thing. You know that from the finite element method, force, equals kx, or in Barthes' term, r equals ku. Now notice at the change of k. In the beginning, k was 3 times 10 power 6, because you can rewrite this equation to say r equals u multiplied by this number. So this number was k. Notice what happened afterwards. Afterwards, k got reduced. The stiffness got reduced, and there is an extra redundant or a compatibility U. This means that in addition to this U, you are gaining another U, and the elastic modulus, or the stiffness in this case, K, got reduced. This reduction in K is a nightmare in the finite element method, because you are used to, I mean, if you check my finite element method series, we are used to calculating a nice cute K matrix, and then just do our magic trick. The problem now in our finite element method is that if you have multiple elements, then you are basically trying to find the stiffness matrix in the elastic domain. But hey, maybe this element has yielded. And if that element yielded, then the corresponding elements and the stiffness matrix will change. Now, this happens multiple times, but when does that happen? We don't know. That's the reason why usually we will be applying our loads and steps, kind of like what we have done here, to detect if any element yields and update the stiffness matrix accordingly. Now, this is something that future you has to worry about. You don't need to worry about this right now. All you have to do is bask in the amazing glory that is the nonlinear analysis. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for watching. And before I finish, I want to give a huge nonlinear sized shout out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level 
whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and so on, especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye bye.